looking around, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free It's a modern homestead Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, joined again by Rachel Jameson. And Rachel, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm uh, getting a little bit tired of the yo yo with our weather up here, but yeah. Hopefully it ends soon. We had almost freezing temperatures again last night. Uh, yeah. Actually, last night here was the coolest it's been in a while. I think it got down to like 43. Hasn't been getting that low. We've had some pretty pretty warm nights. I mean, 50s and even 60, I think around 60 a couple nights. And I mean, for nights this time of the year, that's that's pretty good. Yeah. But we're getting like 70s and 80s, upper 70s and low 80s oh, wow. during the day. Which, so it's been pretty warm. Is that normal? to get 80 i think it's a little warmer but we've been getting plenty of rain too so it's been it's been okay you know it's been good yeah i think we should just go ahead and fess up rachel this is a really hard podcast to do because we've already did it once this is take two (laughs) because it didn't record the first time so um yeah two days later and we're trying (laughs) to um get back in the mindset it's kind of hard yeah we got this. Back into it. Yeah. We got this. We can do this. Yeah. So how, how about the homestead updates, Rachel? What's new on your homestead? Um, right now we well, I planted strawberries, asparagus, and my brassicas. Um about well, it sounds like I just did it, but about two weeks ago, because it's been a while since we've actually been on together. Yeah. And I have all all my little asparagus is coming up, which I didn't expect it to come up the first year. Yeah. But yeah, it's all coming up. The strawberries are doing great. Um, I have the brassicas under cover. We can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. I have um those under cover and we had a small frost. Was it Monday? Monday we had a small frost. I don't see any too much damage on the apple trees because the apples have blossomed. Mm-hmm. So not seeing too much damage. Thankfully, I don't have anything warm planted up here. Technically, you can start planting around the 15th. I always wait till Memorial Day because almost always we get a frost between the 15th and Memorial Day. So I have not planted any of my hot stuff like tomatoes and peppers or lettuce, which isn't a hot stuff, but it will freeze. So I haven't planted any of that. I got everything out. Actually, about a week before the suggested plant time here, uh, peppers and tomatoes and everything, because, man, the weather just looked great. <laughs> and it has I been. I almost so. did it, but I'm glad um, I didn't. Yeah, I you're, you're, uh, you're, you're about there covering everything, and I hate that. That's such a, it's a lot of work, but then you're just worried about it still, because if it's yep. hard, if it gets really cold, even that won't protect it, you know. And so it's it's always, a, it's, um, yeah. it's a dangerous thing when you plant too early. But here it worked out really well, and now we're past that time, so we should be fine now. Um, but everything is planted as far as the annual garden goes. Um, and everything's up. I was just out there looking before we jumped on this podcast and like the squash is like four or five inches tall. And I planted most of my garden this year from seed. Like I didn't start a lot, um, of plants in the house, okay. I, a few, but not a lot. And, uh, I mean, the brassicas I did, uh, the, the cabbage and the broccoli and the cauliflower I did. And of course, tomatoes and peppers. Um, but just about everything else I've been growing from seed this year. So I'm, it's probably going to come in a little bit later. Uh, and, I, and the squash is looking great. I mean, it's already up pretty good. Um, cucumbers are up pretty good. Now I've got cucumbers going in the greenhouse as well as out in the uh, garden. Um, Cause I'm wanting to try them in the aquaponic system. And, and it's amazing. The difference I planted them in the greenhouse about a week later and they're like four inches taller than the wow. ones in the ground. 
So it's so, amazing. So what's the difference? Do you think just the that just aquaponics, the warmth, or do you just, think well, it's the aquaponics? It's the aquaponics. Yeah, okay. I, I think because I don't. It, the temperature is the same. I have the door open and the hatch open, and it's pretty much you the same. You always make me jealous of your greenhouse. I want one so I, bad. <laughs> it's blowing my mind how fast I'm. I've never even grown cucumbers in it before. But so my biggest worry with the cucumbers was trellising in them because they like to climb and trellis. So what I did is I attached fence to the ceiling. Uh, cause I have these little lock things that lack into my greenhouse. They have like these rails and you can lock these little hangers in them. And I wired up fencing to that all the way down to the grow beds. So they're going to be able to trellis up, uh, up the ceiling at an angle and then hang down, so which I think is pretty cool. In there. It's going to look pretty cool. I think. And, that you know, of course I've got cool. the water chestnuts, which we, oh yeah. So another thing I've been doing is really updating some things on my aquaponic system. I added a solids filter because the water was getting a little murky and it's a bigger system than I'm, than I'm used to running. Cause I've made, you know, the, the holding tank for the fish is pretty big, right. more beds than I'm used to running. So there's a lot more there. So I've never ran a solid, a solids filter. I've just drained it, cleaned it, did my thing. Um, but I wanted to put on a solids filter to this cause it was getting pretty murky. So I added a, a solids filter and I added kind of a modified wicking bed. Cause I think I'd mentioned, I think in our last episode we'd done together, um, I talked about how a lot of things were didn't look like they were going to make it on my homestead. And one of those things was the water chestnuts that I had planted in my aquaponic system. And the other thing was my fig tree. And lo and behold, both of them things are up. The fig tree is growing from the base, looking great, a um, nice. few inches tall already. And the water chestnuts sprouted, and they're six, seven inches tall now. So, but what I, in doing more research for the water chestnuts, I found that I have to plant them in deeper soil okay. uh, so because they, they grow down and they just fill up a, like you can plant them in like five gallon bucket and they'll fill the entire bucket up with water chestnuts like one water chestnut planted in there so i took grow bags and filled them up with soil planted the what took them out of the the shallow bed that i had made for them put them in those and then like i said i built a i had added on um to my aquaponic system a modified wicking bed i took a 40 gallon heavy duty tote i ran off of my solids filter over to that to where it runs in and runs out and it works like a wicking bed right but i got to right. raise a little higher so the water's higher and it basically comes right to the top of those wicking uh those those grow bags those are like working like a wicking effect because they're filled with soil so they're basically wicking grow bags <laughs> and from the uh, and i just set two of those down there and it filled up the entire tote um, so then that water's flowing back out and then running back to the fish tank. So it's getting going through the solids filter into the wicking beds for the water chestnuts back to the water tank. And then I've got the grow beds above the fish tank that are still running the same. They're just every okay. couple hours that's they cool. fill they ebb and flow. And that's what's producing the cucumber. So it's just a bunch of stuff I added on to my um to my uh aquaponic system. So that's kind of been kind of fun. And then for the garden, like I said, the entire annual garden's planted. So I've just been going around and kind of adding to the guilds. I mean, separating some uh, herbs and replant, you know, planting them in more guilds and things like that. So just working on the guilds now. So it's busy times, busy times. Yeah, I, mean, I love it. And I and, both also have jobs too. So we're going to work and we're coming home and we're raising yeah. up our gardens. But I think I said, you know, I definitely said it in the last time we talked, which was the unrecorded episode, was how excited I'm getting about gardening now. I mean, I feel like yes. through these previous months, we kind of we struggle to find things to talk about because we're not that excited yeah. about everything because it's just it's just the wrong time of the year, you know, but we're thinking about it. But once you actually start doing it, you get so excited, you know, and I'm so ready to get out there in that garden every day. I just want to get out there and start working now. So I love yeah. it. It's my time of the year. You said that. You said that. You said something about recording. And I looked up in the corner of our computer to make sure <laughs> to see if it was recording. recording. We're going to be we're, we're going to be paranoid gonna be about it now. Panicky. We're going to be a little bit panicky, folks. <laughs> yeah. I, and you know what? I think I've been re podcasting for like eight years. I think that was only the second time that's ever happened. <gasps> Man. And um, the first time I was using Skype back in the day, and it happened with a Skype episode. Well, at least it wasn't a guest. Yeah, so that would have been. Just me. That's, I was, that would be worse. I was really panicky, too, because I actually had a guest episode that I recorded after we talked, like, like a few hours after that. And I was so nervous that that one was going to do the <laughs> same thing. But it was good. We got that one. 
<laughs> yeah, um, truth be told, I did that with one of our guests and they were very nice and accommodating. You did. I remember that now. It did happen to you, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. I actually I forgot to hit record. Yeah. And then they were very nice and we started over and thankfully it was only 10 minutes. But now we just have it come on right away when we start talking. And it was yeah, on when we began safer. begin yeah. when we began our podcast, it was on. And then we had some internet issues and we think that's what happened, but who knows what happened? It's tech yeah. technology. We, you never know what it'll do. Right? What you got for a book recommendation this week? So the book I have this week is actually kind of pertains to the topic we're going to be talking about today, but it's called the organic gardener's handbook of natural pest and disease control. It is put out of course by Rodale, which puts out some really good books um, there's a book similar to it that I also own, but what I like about this book is it actually has color photos, which is super helpful. There's color photos of certain pests, um, which is helpful when you're trying to decide what bug this is. Is this friend or foe? There's photos of, uh, for example, cedar cedar apple rust so even the diseases there's photos of but they're color mm -hmm. which is super nice yeah that's helpful that, that yeah. color the other book that i have they're not color um they're just either drawings or they're they're black and white which is kind of hard sometimes with some of these diseases i mean and even with photos sometimes you're still which one is that so anyways yeah. i really like this book it, it has it's pretty detailed and it goes through some of these plants I've actually not even heard of. So it goes through a long list of different plants and their um, pests that they can have and <clears throat> diseases that they can have for each plant. It's just, it's a really good book. Yeah. I think that's definitely one I need to get on my shelf because I like the idea of having something with color photos. Like you said, that's really valuable. Um, the book that I'm recommending this week uh, is one I just picked up a couple weeks ago, but it's a really small book. It's like 90 something pages. It's called Weeds and What They Tell Us. And this big book, I think, was actually written in the 1950s. And I heard this book mentioned in a garden course, a garden master course I'm taking right now through Permies um, that I, I highly recommend, by the way. I'm only a few hours into it, and it's a 35 hour um, garden master course but it's really technical. It's really good. And I love it. And and I've already been convinced of a few things in this course, but anyway, back to the book, <laughs> they rec they talked about this book and mentioned this book in there. And I'm like, I'm going to check that out. And, and in this book, like I said, it doesn't cover, like, it's not an exhaustive list of weeds, but it's a lot of common weeds. And one of the things I don't like about it is it's not in color and it's hand draw, yeah. it's hand drawn weeds, but it's really good though. I mean, you get a pretty accurate description and it basically will tell you, like why you might have that weed, like what might be going on with your soil. Um, like, is it rich in nitrogen? Is it low in phosphorus? If it's going something, because a lot of weeds, um, when they, when they come forth, it's because there's something that's changed in yeah. the, the weed seeds right. been there for yeah. maybe decades, but there's something that's changed in the soil that's made it start growing. So there's a lot you can learn about, about soil by just knowing what weeds are popping up, uh, what it's lacking, what it's got too much of things like that. Um, it also gives some suggestions on how to get rid of it or changes you can make in your soil that'll make it go away or not continue to come back. So it's a pretty neat little book. I mean, like I said, it's really small, but um, no yeah. fluff whatsoever in this book. It's straight to the point, 100%, this, 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 and it just lists it out, goes to the next weed. I mean, there's no fluff in this thing at all. <laughs> yeah, I have heard about that before, but I didn't know there was a book out there, so... Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, those two book uh, recommendations, links for both of those will be. I in the also show notes. purchased yeah. that. Um, well, I also have that garden, garden master, master course. course. Yeah. I'm trying to use the words properly because it's not the opposite. They changed it to garden master, master garden, garden course, course is what for you would a take. Reason. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, I can't wait to start it. It's a very, I've heard a lot of really good things about it. It's really good. Like I said, I'm going to write a more formal review about it when I'm completely done with it, but I can already tell you it's worth the money. Um, it's yeah. a good course and it's all video. It's 35 hours of video. Uh, I got the accompanying um, book, PDF book that goes with it. And it's like a couple hundred pages. Um, yeah, and that's through Permies. 
Yeah, it's all through permies.com. Like I said, I can drop a I'll drop a link in the show notes for it if you if somebody just wants maybe to check it out or even get it right away. But like I said, I'll be writing more. I'll have a lot more to say about it and have a review post about it when I'm done with it, uh, the course. But I'm trying to kind of go a little bit slow through it because it's it's pretty deep and I'm wanting to really absorb it. I'm not just speeding through it just to write a review about it. I want to I want to learn from it. And I can tell you I've learned a lot already. And I it's amazing when you do things like that. You you really awaken to just how much you don't know when you go through something like this, you know, is it, no matter the more, you know, the more you realize you oh, need to know more. Worst? Like <laughs> I have people ask me all the time and they think yeah. that I'm an expert and I'm just like, I am so far from an expert on any of this. Yeah. I learn every day just how much I don't know. <laughs> and yes, it's good. Cause exactly. I love to learn. And you know, life is a, is a, you know, you got a lifetime of learning, you know, that's what it's well, that's all about why, in life. So that's why we have guests on. We try to bring on <laughs> other homesteaders and guests that know more than we do because we want to learn from some of it. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, when I think I first started this podcast, uh, you know, many years ago now, um, that was one of my motives actually. It's like, I can get right. like free cons- con- consulting just by having these guests on, you know, and telling me how to do things. It was part of it. I got to admit, I was like, come teach me, you know, so it was good. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, both of them books go along well with our topic today, which is um, basically the garden's planted. Now what? Uh, yeah. What do you do after you've planted your garden? You got your garden in. Now you just sit around and wait till harvest. Not quite. It don't really work like that, does it? No, I, in some ways I wish it was that simple. Know. I, and in other I, ways, I, enjoy I really process. enjoy the process. Yeah. I yeah, do too. I, I enjoy, enjoy the process. You know, I enjoy getting my cup of coffee in the morning and putting on my sandals or not. Sometimes I'm out there barefoot and I'm just walking through the garden and looking at stuff. And yeah. I really, I really enjoy the process. But yeah, I do too. There's been years. I'm not going to lie. There's been years where <laughs> well, there's been a disease I was battling or the weather was horrible or I had tests that maybe it wasn't as enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about is weeds. We're going to talk about weeds, watering yeah. and then watching. And we're going to talk about a few things you watch for, but weeds are the first thing on the list. And, and Management of of weeds can be challenging. Uh, I will admit, just yesterday, um, evidently last year, I had some lambs quarter growing nearby oh, yeah. that I let go to seed. Evidently, because there you can see in my garden where you could, there was just like this circle, and it went across paths, and it went through the garden beds. It was covering like three garden beds and the pathways, and there was just like three or four hundred seedlings of lambs quarter. And it, and it was just so weird. You could see it in like a circle, like the like the like the seeds just let loose right. in this pattern. And so I'm out there on my hands and knees for a couple hours, pulling out lambs quarter um, seedlings out of this area, out of the paths. But which the paths have- weren't bad because it's mulch. So I'm just lifting them right out right. of that mulch, you know. But they had taken root in the garden beds pretty good, so that was a little bit harder to get out. Um, but now I consider lambs free, quarter um, salad though. Absolutely. A lot of it did get, get salvaged. I mean, there's, you can use it for animal feed. You can use it for uh, salads or putting in stir fry or other dishes. Cause you can cook it too. It's, it's good. It's good to eat. It's very nutritious. Yeah. Um, but especially when it's young like that, it's, you know, it's really tender and it's really nice good. And tender then. Um, yeah. I will admit a bunch of it just got laid back on top of the garden beds <laughs> because that's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it um, also makes great compost. So, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I consider part of weeding the management of valuable weeds because I have purslane. I have, of course, yeah. lamb's quarter, even where I don't want it. I have dandelion. You have chickweed. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that grow. Uh, yeah. Purple dead Plantain, nettle. There's a lot of things that grow that. Mullen. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, all of those. <clears throat> yeah. I've got milkweed. Yeah growing over in a corner where I've never had it before. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's fine right there. I'm just going to leave it because yeah. it's not really in the way of anything and butterflies love it and uh, just leave it alone. So I consider part of weeding just the management of the valuable weeds. Cause I do want to keep a certain amount of those things. Yeah. You just don't want those things everywhere. They're a blessing to have. They're just not a blessing to have in your garden bed. Yeah, sometimes some of them are edible or medicinal yeah. and, but yeah, you don't want it to take over. I mean, one, some of those plants, like with your lamb's quarters, yeah, lamb's it puts quarter, off tons you know, of seeds. One of them went to seed and then poof. We yeah, they a, put we off tons mega of tons of seed. Purslane, I love. Like, I like to manage purslane because you can use it like a ground cover. Um, it will, 
you, if you, yeah. I mean, it's it will like, get kind of tall if you let it just go crazy, but if you've got it around things like peppers, I mean, I remember one year I had a, a raised bed, uh, that I had nothing but peppers in that. And I had this like mat of purslane just growing all through it. It's not going to hurt peppers. It ain't going to get as tall as peppers. So I pretty much let it go. And, you know, and it got seven, eight inches tall and, but it was underneath the peppers still. And it just kind of spread out in this entire bed. And I loved it. It worked out great. It was, it worked like a, a living mulch, you know, and, yeah. uh, and I ate plenty of it and I love, I love personally. And it's actually one of my favorite weeds to eat. I just love the texture of it. And, um, you can put it in things like soups and things like that. I mean, we won't get into all that, but I mean, it's I really, love, really good. Yeah. And I love that idea of like the, the living mulch on mm-hmm. these plants and stuff. So, yeah. So, so part of weeding is just managing those weeds, but there is a time when you got a lot of weeds and they're in your way Yeah, and pulling weeds, you just have to get in there and pull them. You know, you have to just get in there and yeah. do the work um, there's some ways that you can reduce that, but especially in the early days when you have seedlings, weeds can yes. easily overtake the seedlings. For sure. And um, so there, there is that process of, and they can rob what's in your soil. Sure. If you get a lot of it, yeah, they can rob what's in your soil and that your plant needs. So, yeah, yeah. That's like this time of year, right mm. after I've just planted and stuff is just popping up and you learn to notice like I have baby beets right now that look, they're so tiny. And if you didn't know what they looked like, you would think they were a weed, but yeah, you learn to recognize them. At, but I go out every other day right now, at least maybe even more and just keep, keep it weeded. Once yeah. I have some weeds. Day. I absolutely do not want you do too. Like you've talked about bindweed oh, and I have, bindweed. I have morning glory just as bad. Yeah. Same thing. The bindweed and that's it. Yeah. When, wow. And I have, I have morning glory popping up everywhere. And I, I have, it out, I was out there, like I said, yesterday pulling weeds and I already see it coming up everywhere. So yeah. those I'm just, I'm getting out. Well, the bad thing about those is you break the roots. It's Same coming right back. Weed, it spreads around, yeah. Bind weed spreads yeah. around. And so it's like, grass? it's oh. so hard to manage. Yeah. Crabgrass creep, creep in there. It, it actually, I, I like what I did with my gardens. I actually got paths. I made mulch paths around all my gardens. So I kept the grass line away from the actual garden bed. So yeah. I get it creeping into my, my mulch paths, but that's easier to maintain. Cause actually I can, I'll make like a vinegar spray and I will spray those paths. Well, I can't do that in my garden beds, but I can do that along the edges of the paths right up next to the grass line without it affecting my garden and yeah, it'll kill that crabgrass that. off. So it works out great like that. Or like on one side of my garden, I've got a complete row of, of comfrey that I've got actually separating the path right. from the grass and no grass is going to creep past that comfrey because yeah, it makes a root, a thick root mat that just will yeah. not let it through the plus the leaves hanging over and, and keeping it, you know, from just being able to, to live with no, within the shade. So works out great. Well, so there's things you mulch, can do like that. That mulch makes it so much easier to pull. Yeah. Weeds. I mean, it just, yeah, absolutely. the roots can't take hold. Usually you can pull them pretty simply. Yeah, if you get them young before that root gets down too yeah. deep or starts getting through something. Yeah. It works really, really well, but there are some things you can do for weed suppression in your garden beds. And one is mulch. There's several things you can use for mulch, um, wood chips. A lot of people just go with straight wood chips in the garden. Uh, and that, and that's become a popular method with the back to Eden methods and lasagna gardens and a lot of stuff like that, the different ways of doing different things. But um, it's become really popular, I think, to use wood chips in the garden. Um, another thing that's become really popular is using things like straw and hay. Uh, Ruth Stout yes. was big on using hay, I believe it was, that she just lay a bunch of hay out there and toss seeds in it pretty much and grow her garden. And, um, and it keeps the weeds down. It does a good job. Now it will sprout some weeds too. Yes, it will. I used that a lot in the past and it does sprout some of it. I use some. It's so easy to pull out of that, that it's people don't really think too much about it because the weeds will just basically yank right out. They're not, they have no root grab in the ground at all. So, um, they just come out. They're real easy. I used it on my potatoes last year to hill after I got that initial hilling. I was actually watching this video the other day and this lady, I I wish I could give her credit, but I can't remember who it was now, but she was talking about several things you could use for mulch in the garden. Like she was rating them what she felt like, felt like was the best. And, and I was thinking, you know, sometimes it's hard to find wood chips. I mean, if you're not getting chip drops and things like that, 
you know, here. grass is great if you got like if you're say you're mowing and you're except you know grabbing getting a lot of like bagging the grass, you can use that as long as it ain't seeded. You know, make sure it's low. It's been you've been kept cut. Right. And you don't or have sprayed. Seed in it. Yep. Or sprayed. Um, you know, things like that work great. Of course, chop and drop works great. She had mentioned something that I had never thought of, and it's really inexpensive because I, in my mind, it just blows away. And you know the when you can go down to like a, a feed store or whatever. And you buy like those little uh, pine chips for like bedding for like chickens oh, yeah. or whatever. Uh, and those came, this kind this kind of come in these come compressed in like squares. Compressed. Yeah, they're really compressed. There's a lot of it in there. And yes, and she actually demonstrated using it. And she says, you think it would blow away, but it doesn't. It actually sticks pretty good to the soil. And, and he said, it's a really inexpensive. You can buy one of those like five or six bucks, one of them big old square bales yes. that are compressed. And I actually did that yesterday. I went down and got a couple of those you and I actually mulched my entire garden with them because I've been running low on wood chips and things. And um yeah. so I I actually use that in my garden beds and maybe I'll do that. It work it looks like it's working great. It isn't blowing away. It was actually kind of windy when I was putting it down. Nothing once it hit the ground though, it stuck. And um I'm like, okay. I guess I was thinking maybe the pine may not be the bet, but I don't think that she said there's no issues with it at all. And she's been using it. I thought, well, and it looks pretty good right. on there too. Well, so we have, I mean, oh, you wouldn't even believe the amount of leaves that we get here. And leaves are another great mulch you would option. Think yeah. that with all the leaves we get here, I mean, I for bags and bags and bags of leaves, but once they get shredded, I yeah. use them shredded. Once they get shredded and composted down a little bit, there's not that much, and so I'm running yeah. out of that. And yeah, I try those pine chips. I, I find the same thing. I run low. I mean, with the, between the leaves and the things I'm, you know, I'm running things through the wood chipper and, you know, if I'm not bringing, and I'm trying to do this thing where I'm not bringing in a ton of resources, but I'm finding that I'm using my wood chips more in my pathways where I need them because that's, I, I like my, I like my mulch pathways, you know? So I'm using wood chips there instead of the garden. So I'm running out of stuff to, you know, mulch the garden with. So that was seemed like a very affordable option because those things are really inexpensive. So you know, hopefully they're pretty clean, but you know, uh, she says she's been using them and there's and no issue. I would use my grass clippings cause we don't spray anything, but we have a dog. Yeah. There's potential issues with that. So I just don't anyway. want my accidental dog poo on leaves and stuff. It doesn't sound very safe. Well, and the good thing yeah. is, you know, even when you're using wood chips, you want to know the source of those wood chips because if it had like walnut or anything like that, that could actually hurt your garden. Um, where these are one kind of tree. These are pine chips. These are one kind. Yeah. So, you know, there's not, there's not a mixture. No, they're not. They're not. or anything because they're for no. animal bedding. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it, they should be fairly safe. So, it, you know, yeah. it's, I don't know. It seemed like a good option to me that I'd never even thought of before. <laughs> so anyway. It's expensive. And that, no. like said, those bales are I, They're so. Yeah. I took about a bag and a half. I, I have 10 four by eight beds in in this one bed area and it took about a bag and a half of it to to mulch all that. So what would that be like eight bucks? You know, a bag and a half. That's, that's it's, pretty cheap because it's meant yeah, for bedding. I think it was under six bucks a, a bale of it, like a square compressed bale of it. Well, so, you have me convinced, Harold. Not bad. Well, I mean, I, I'm new to it, <laughs> so I guess I'll leave it at that. But well, maybe I'll try um, it on some. Maybe other. somebody would have some objections they would want to tell us about why not to use that, but. My biggest objection was that I thought it would just blow away, but it got pretty windy and breezy last night and nothing moved at all. It's stuck to the ground yeah. pretty good. I think you'd want it to be pretty, not too windy when you're actually putting it down right? because right. when you're dropping it, that's when it would blow away. But once it hit the ground, it stayed. So anyway, we could stay on that all day. Um, another method that we use, both you and I both use to keep weeds down is intensive growing methods. We yeah, don't I necessarily use it for the weed issue, but more of a space issue with us. But it works but it for keeping the weeds down. It does yeah. help a lot. Yeah. I plant stuff pretty close together. Um, yeah. The the, su the suggestion on the back of the packet is only a suggestion here because I, I just plant things super close and then I interplant, you know, like we've talked, we can yeah. talk about when we get down to pests, but I interplant certain plants to help with pests and um. The only thing is when you plant intensively, you have to make sure that you have decent soil and feed it. Yeah, you got to have plenty of feed in that soil for those plants. And and the thing is, though, um, if you put something there, nature can't put something there. Yep. You know, and that's that's the whole deal. You keep it to where it's covered up 
and something's going to grow there if you don't grow it yeah. and you're going to have to weed. That's just the reality. If you follow the directions on the back of that seed packet, <laughs> you're going to be doing some weeding. I guarantee you. Yeah. It's yeah. just the way it's going to be. You've got a lot of space well, there. It's just open area. Unless you're mulching heavily, I guess. You could right, get around yeah, it with mulching. That's true. Um, or, but, um, yeah, that's the thing, too, is you use less water. Yeah. Because you're shading the thing. Yeah, which we'll get into on our next topic here in a couple of minutes as far as something you're watching for. Um, another way to mulch, it's not really a mulch, but it keeps down weeds, is using the plastic or the woven landscape fabric on top of the soil. Yeah. People use that under mulch and under things, you know, and then put mulch on top of it. But if you're using it, a lot of people have gotten to where, especially in market gardeners, will just roll that yes. stuff on top of the soil, burn holes in it, and then plant in those holes. Yeah. Works really well. Now, if you're doing a bigger space. Yeah, it does work well. Yeah. Weeds, it will suppress the weeds. It will keep the soil moist under that. So you'll mm -hmm. have a lot of, you know, that issues taken care of. Again, it's plastic. It's woven landscape fabric, which is actually a plastic that they just weaved. Um, they do I have seen studies, though. Ones. I have seen studies, yeah. though, that are that they're they're finding like microfibers of this plastic in the soil, like oh, they're testing okay. and stuff. So it's really not. If if you're really wanting to create the healthiest soil ever, it's probably not the best method. I've seen a lot of yeah. what I would consider organic or better than organic growers use it, but it. Yeah. It will break down in sunlight I after think a while. Came out with some new products that are biodegradable, the, though. They're yeah, crazy, if you can though. find, but it's probably a lot more expensive. Yes, and, they you are. Know, so, yeah. I mean, there's there's give and take there always. Um, mm -hmm. It's an option. I'm just saying it's an option for a lot of people. If if weeding is like, say, you just have zero time. You're a busy. You're working sixty hours a yep. week. You got kids, or you got things going on. Little kids, and you can't help you in the garden. You got to be in the house with them or whatever. It's an option because weeding does take. It's one of the things that probably take the most time with a garden if you have yes. no way of managing that. Yeah, if, you're, if your management method is to go out there and pull weeds, uh, it, it can be pretty time consuming. <laughs> so yeah. doing well, something like that. With that is just not let them get so big that they, they take over. Yeah, right, right. So okay. there's just some ways that and some things you have to kind of watch out for in the weeds and some things you can do to help with that. Um, another thing after you've planted your garden that a lot of people are concerned, about, especially a newer gardeners is watering. Like how often do I water? How wet do they have to be? I see a lot of new gardeners over watering gardens, actually yeah. just drowning gardens. And that will kill a plant deader <laughs> than a drought. will. I mean, quicker. And there's no reversing it. At least when a plant starts getting thirsty, it starts looking wilted. You can get some water to it when it's yeah. dying when it gets to the point where it's like yellowed it's probably almost too late to save it it's probably got root rot um yeah. you know you can and drown you just a plant welcome diseases when you overwater yeah. yeah. too especially with specific plants like uh tomatoes for example will get blights easier if you're yeah. constantly wet and moist so there's some there's some ways that watering is better ideally watering underneath the plant at the ground level is the best when you're overhead wa watering again you're, like you just mentioned you're inviting things like diseases and and you know uh like blight and things because when that's you get that splash too that's a lot of it yeah. it's, it comes from the well, ground but a splash up. again a mulch can yeah, yeah definitely mulch plays a big part in watering because of that it can prevent splash from the ground which carries can yeah. carry a lot of disease issues um it also the mulch will help retain water by by having mulch down you won't have to water as often or maybe not at all if you're living in a place that gets regular rainfall because it will yeah. help retain that moisture in the soil which is where you need it ideally you want to deep water uh, most plants some plants that have shallow roots like some of your uh, leafy lettuce. greens like yeah. lettuce they they can actually take it more often and less deep watering but your especially your fruited plants and things that have deeper roots you want to water pretty heavy and less often. And, and that's a yep. good method. So deep watering is that's called deep watering. Yep. That's what we do here or try yeah. to, I mean, we have a few things here and there that need different kinds of attention, but yeah, for the most part, we do deep watering. Yeah. And another method for watering is a better method is for early morning or late evening. Yeah. In other words, not in the middle of the day, <laughs> watering yeah. your garden. Works. Yeah. That's for everywhere. Yeah. I mean, even if you're, I mean, it works really good if you're out West and it dries 
super quick because you're just evaporating most of it. Mm -hmm. And it also works for here where rain just kind of falls from the sky. Right. Um, and, and you'll get more of it in the soil when you do that, but it can also burn your plants. It can actually scald your plants. If it's yeah. the sun's right in the middle of the sky and it's 90 degrees outside and you go spraying cool water on them plants, those droplets of water that are yeah. sitting on the leaves of your plants are going to heat up so fast. They can actually yeah. sc like scald your, the leaves of your plants. So it can actually damage your plants and weaken them if you're watering in the middle of the day. So early morning is best, but late yeah. evening is kind of a second choice. And so just not through the day when the sun's up is, is best. Um, and again, that mulch is, is huge too uh, on that. So, and that's if you're overhead watering, but even if you're watering, you know, even if you have, say you have, um, drip irrigation that's kind of dropping it on top of the soil even then it's going to evaporate really fast if it's really hot out in the middle yeah. of the day so even if you're doing drip irrigation it's still better to do it in the morning or the evening yeah and that's now, if you have combine these things it's helpful now i have so, seen yeah yeah i have seen drip irrigation that runs underneath mulch in a garden like they put the mulch oh. over the drip irrigation that's not which and that really and then i guess it, it would have less of an effect i guess you could just probably about do it any time then Probably. But again, your setup. Um, I don't use drip irrigation. Um, you tried because you water from a pond and it I clogs water up from the a drip. pond. Yeah. And even with three filters, it plug clogs up. So I have yeah. to water from overhead. So I usually water our timer. We have a timer for the most part, and um, it goes by the week, not by the day. Yeah. Be okay, but I rely heavily on the rain that falls from the sky, and. But I do have emergency sprinkler systems that water from overhead. For like last year, they ran a lot because it was so dry last year. I'm hoping this year will not be a repeat. So far, it's looking great. I mean, it's starting out great. We're getting like not every here. third day, we're getting we're a rainfall, dry. which is great. We're yeah, dry. it's a little dry, but it's it's doing. But it's been really warm too. We've been getting yeah. about every three days. We've been getting a nice rain, so it's not been bad. I, I'm been doing a little bit of watering on like leafy green stuff you know but tomatoes peppers i haven't even been worried about them um i did drop some seeds like the nasturtiums in the front i've been trying to water them a little bit more often to get them going some things i've been watering a little bit but it's been doing pretty good i, I gotta admit yeah um so I've, anyway i always i've had to water this year already because we've been pretty dry but um that watering from a pond has been great except for we've had to use that overhead and the disease yeah. And yeah it can invite it for sure which is why i water that's why i prefer to do the deep watering just kind so, of give those leaves a break how do you know when to water well i have water gate i have rain gauges mm -hmm. in just old-fashioned dollar tree <laughs> cheapy a rain gauge in the garden in a couple places and then i do have a i have a moisture meter you what's your around. what's your aim on those moisture on those water gauges what are you looking for an inch it depends on the plant so i don't want to get too I, I think on really an average plant, i think average, yeah about an i've inch heard an inch. inch on an average like uh, they want an inch of rain per yeah few days about, i don't know what, i hear what it is an now but two a week it depends yeah a week on, there you go yeah yeah, yeah. And, and if um, not you're watering yeah normally we don't have to worry too much about that but the last couple of years have been pretty dry yeah. here unusual i am you want to talk about old school i'm old school no meter for me i take this index finger right here Stick and i it cram in. it down in the ground and if it comes up with at about two or three inches under the grant soil that it's moist i'm good if it's dry right. i'm watering <laughs> I mean, honestly, right. that, yeah. that's how I've always done it. And if it, it, it's like, I stick my finger down, you know, three or four yeah. inches into the ground and you can tell if the ground, if it's, there's moisture there. Well, and, and if I there's no moisture, I water. That the better your soil gets, the yeah. less, I think you have to worry about this. We started with sand. So I had mm -hmm. to measure, I had to see how much we were getting a week because literally we were watering all the time because of the sand. But, and honestly, I don't know. Hardly ever a time when you, if you got mulch, if you got deep mulch in your garden, which a lot of people are doing like wood chips and things like that, yeah. you pull that back. It's almost, unless you've had a yeah. serious drought, it's almost always moist. Yeah. You get to the point where you barely need to water once yeah. you get yeah. that going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's comes a point, I guess, if it's hundred degrees out and you ain't had rain for four right. weeks. You're probably going, it probably isn't. It's probably starting to dry out, but right. well, and your most of the time. Tell you, I mean, I've gone out last year when it was super dry and. I try not to water too much because we do 
use a pump and we end up with a high electric bill. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, you go out there and your tomato plants are just looking really sad. You may not know the answer to this because this might be a more of an answer question for your husband, but what size of a pump do you use to pump water that far up to your garden? Do you know? That is more of a question for my husband. Okay. And I say that because I've tried a quarter horsepower sump pump in a barrel of rainwater Uh to run it through my sprinkler system. And it will, it doesn't put out near enough pressure to get it to go full blast. It ain't near as much pressure as what comes out of my faucet. Interesting. So I I would think it would probably take at least a half horsepower motor. It's probably pretty Um, powerful because when we, we run, we have underground sprinklers that we put in at Mm -hmm. our, at the house. And so it will water the grass that we have, which is a lot. It'll water the grass and the, the ornamental plants and the garden. And all of that goes uphill Mm, yeah, so it's probably it, you might have at least it's at least a half, it but might it might be like be a three one. quarter or <laughs> a one know. horsepower. Big every sump, year yeah. we have to fix the not the pump, but the the uh, PVC pipe that goes down into the pump. Really? Yeah. I think when it, every year when the lake freezes, it messes with that, so he has to fix it again this year. But every yeah, year we that. but we use that from there, and I think we get beautiful plants partially because it's muck. And full of fish poop and mm-hmm. algae and which is what gets stuck in the in the pump and in the the hoses, mm-hmm. even though we filter it. But um it makes for beautiful plants. Yeah, they love that that stuff. But you're right, it will plug some stuff up and oh, uh, cause every you some year. issues. But <laughs> every yeah, year, the garden loves what it. We have going, we still get plugged at least once a year. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, so there's kind of watering in a nutshell one of the things you have to do after you've planted your garden but now there's a whole host of things though you can watch for after you plant that garden as your garden's growing and between now and harvest you're going to do a lot of watching and you're some some of the things you're going to watch for and we'll break them down in more individually here in a minute are nutrient deficiencies in your plants insect pressure disease issues and then of course beyond the garden you're watching for the weather. So you're just, there's a lot of things to determine what you need to do to your garden. So let's just start with plant nutrient deficiencies. What are you looking for in plant nutrient deficiencies? Um, I'm usually looking for yellowing or curling leaves or spots on leaves. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically that's kind of it. And that's why I go through the garden every morning I walk through the garden and you learn this one looks different. Yeah. Something's going on with this plant. And experience will tell you is that disease, insect, or nutrient deficiency. Right. And that and you'll have to really kind of just figure that out. And you'll learn that with experience because you'll know what blight looks like on a tomato. Yeah. But then you'll also know what um squash bugs do to a, a leaf on a squash plant. Yes. And yes. and so I mean they look but the yellowing and the browning around the edges it looks kind of similar. It could be disease right. or it could be bugs, but you know the plant and what it does and what your the, the what was probably the issue. tomatoes. Yeah, or- blossom in rot being a calcium deficiency. But what is it because there's no calcium in the soil or is it because it's not has enough right. water that's, to uptake? Yeah. That's the key. I mean, it might need more water so it can uptake that calcium. Um, there's just you'll learn things like that as a gardener, and it takes time. And and that's why I'm glad there's a lot of great resources out there there's a lot of great books there's youtube videos there's blog posts hopefully there's a good podcast or two you know about (laughs) (laughs) that can kind of help you with that but you'll learn about things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and and the things that 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 will cause a certain effect in your plants like you said yellowing browning wilting you know just different Mm -hmm. things Um, and a lot of that can be from plant nutrient deficiencies so it just takes a little bit of experience to start knowing what that is and what you need to do about it so that's something you and i are both looking for we're looking for do i need yeah. more nitrogen in this area is there some is there something here that i need more nitrogen you know is there something going on here that says this needs some magnesium you know or whatever um or do you I know, need it, less nitrogen i mean and we're yeah. both still learning. I'm still learning. Oh. You still run into stuff and you're like, well, you know, we just did the potato that? episode and I'm talking about sulfur and yeah, I, there, I obviously I need to add sulfur to my potatoes to get that pH more right. So I can, I mean, these are just things you learn. I mean, I've been gardening for a long time now and yet I'm still, still learning, learning, you know, yeah. what I need to add to certain things to make them grow a certain way. So, right. yeah, I mean, well, it's, and well, you learn even 
that we're still discovering new things, like the fact that the plants not don't necessarily the soil doesn't necessarily need it, but maybe the plant can't access it. Yeah. That's kind of that's new huge. in the last few years. Yeah, that just you know that's science is really kind of discovered, yeah. and you know that you know there's reasons why your plant's not taking up those nutrients. You know, and and a lot of it has to do with water. A lot of it has to do with water, but also a lot water of it has to do with organic matter. Uh, you know, it can be organic matter and also it can be, yeah, you know, a lack of microbes and, and, yeah. and all kinds of things in your soil that really help that plant take it up. Or, you know, maybe it's not taking up this nutrient because it doesn't have this nutrient, which right. that nutrient yes. may not make, you know, it, it just things like that. I mean, it, it really is a lot to it. And that's why I feel like I'm always reading. I'm always learning. I'm always just trying to better understand it. But at the same time, I don't want to like, say all this to scare new gardeners yeah. away because you know i have i had a great crop even when i didn't know nothing about nothing right i'm just putting right, seeds in the exactly. ground I and mean, i'm getting stuff a lot um, of these things like we just said can be fixed with some good well diverse compost and yeah. organic matter i mean yeah really good compost that you've put all sorts of things in not just one thing in but all mm -hmm. sorts of things in can actually help your plants i mean you don't have to get out there with a microscope although you were saying you know people that yeah, well that garden that garden master course that i'm taking they're actually doing that they're getting the microscope on the soil and like look at all this stuff going on right. it's like wow okay we're in a whole nother level of deep now i don't even know in the about yeah and i cool. would even say that i get that scientific about it i mean i read about this stuff and i talk about this stuff and i know it exists but in the end i usually put more compost on. Yeah. And it will solve a host of problems. It will. I mean, it's just a fact. If you've got a really good, rich, diverse right. compost that it's going to compensate for a lot of what you don't know, it's just going to put it there, you know, and it's going to invite the worms and it's going to, they're going to bring in the things and, and, and the, uh, it's going to just bring in that, that your garden needs that you don't even know it needs, but it's going to yeah. fix it in a lot of cases. In extreme cases, you might have to actually bring in. Right. Yeah. specific things you know but it, i would have to have a pretty big kind of universal issue going on in my garden before i do that really most of the time it's just like you said compost chop and drop a little manure maybe a rabbit manure things like that Some you know it's going to fix tea. the problem compost tea those, those things are probably going to fix most of your issues as far as deficiencies go and Thank God for that, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's brought me to this point in gardening. It's put food on my table every year, even when I didn't know a lot about soil life, you know, and things oh, yeah. and same the deficiencies. So it, it works. You don't have to know all this to, but it is things you will want to watch and learn and, and, you know, and gain experience in because there's no doubt it will give you better harvest. And there are years maybe yes. where, you know, it could have a really big impact on your harvest if you're really deficient in some sense. So it's it's things you want to keep an eye out for, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that brings us to insect pressure. Probably my biggest issue. It's not been plant deficiencies for me. It's been insect pressure. Like over the years, it's been Japanese beetles. It's oh. been squash bugs. It's been squash vine borers. It's been um, uh, cabbage moss. I mean, these things have devastated my garden in the past, you know, and I've had to learn to overcome each one of them right. a year at a time. So you have to learn what to look for. I mean, what does squash bugs do to a leaf? Well, flip it over and you'll see them eggs and then you'll see them little um, squash bugs hatching. I actually have a video. I think I put it on YouTube you on really? my YouTube channel one time of these little teeny weeny squash bugs hatching and running all over the uh, back. You hatching. Wow. Yeah. They were just like spreading away from that. They were running right away from the eggs all over the backside of this leaf. And they look like little tiny spiders because they're just going everywhere and they're just oh, yeah. coming out of these eggs. It's wild looking. Yeah. You I actually have a little to, video of and, it. And that's what you start to look for. You start to learn yeah. what plants have those, like squash will get those. Yeah. And um, that's what I do on my morning walk is I'll go out there and I'll flip over leaves and how do you, how do you take they them like how do you, plant on that underside of the leaf. How do you, you get the some, eggs off? Usually I just do soapy water. So yeah, if I, once I find them, I, you know, I hop back into the house, make a little thing of soapy water and get it off with my fingers. I got to where I was like taking some duct tape and wrapping it backwards around my hand to make the sticky oh, side yeah. on my hand. And I just touch them 
touch touch them and it like lifts them all off. <laughs> I've done yeah, that before some, too. There's that too. And um, you can't rip the you leaf s- though if you get too big you of a grip start on it. To flip over those big leaves and you start to see that. Yep. You'll find a lot of a lot of things. And you get out there at night with your light and try to find some tomato hornworms. You'll Kids uh, love that one. You'll you, you know you, you start learning like for me I've had to learn to use row cover for my brassicas. It's the only fix yes. I've found for for keeping the uh, cabbage moss away from my brassicas and Totally. I mean, there was years there where I got very little crop. Well, last brassicas. year I had issues. So you know? this year, the second I put my brassicas in, I put the row cover on. But yeah. I'm also well, last inter- year I did that. I'm also yeah. interplanting onions, and I have my mar. I've got some marigolds that I'm going to be planting mm-hmm. in there too to help. You know, with that yeah. pest pressure. But um, yeah, Anything that's where row cover that's is a- helpful. Yeah, row cover has saved my brassica harvest. I mean, last year I had so much cabbage and so much broccoli and cauliflower and i was it was the first i mean i always get some but that was the first year i got like all i wanted you know it was a it was amazing because i always planted extra because i was just so used to not getting that much so i planted way more i always plant way more than i actually would eat need and last year i got it all because i grow covered everything that's expensive but um so is spraying and then spraying offsets usually some good bugs too yeah so I yeah just, i would prefer the least invasive right. method like i've used things like neem oil and things like that yeah. and, and, and but then again you start yeah you're killing off a lot of good stuff that you want in your garden i want ladybugs and i want praying right. mantises and there's a lot of things i want in my garden you know and a lot of these things you're going to spray they're just going to kill they're everything organic, they're still yeah they're they're there to kill a bug and they'll kill a bug i mean if it's a beetle something's going to kill a beetle it'll kill your ladybugs and you yeah, want ladybugs row cover is just the least invasive and i don't know about you but i think i think what i'm using right now is on it's third year still i mean if third year for me as well yeah this is my third year i'm using it and still working um i'll have to buy a lot more next year because that's what i'm using i took big wads of it and shoved it in my filter that i made for my aquaponic system so it's my filter substance right now for my uh my filter my solids filter on my aquaponic system so i took some big wads of it so now i'm gonna have to go buy some more now but that's it's not that expensive but um no it's not and you can actually i have enough out there already i have a lot of extra so it can also help a little bit i mean we'll talk about this in a minute but can help with some frost and and just sure sure yep but insect pressure is something you'll look for. You'll know what is, you'll see certain holes in leaves mm-hmm. and you'll, you'll just be able to identify, I got this issue. And then you just got to learn what to do about it, you know? And again, there's a lot of resources out there. And we've talked about a lot of these things on past podcasts that people can look up and, and, and hear us talk about what we did to get rid of those things. So just do some homework when you start identifying the pressure. Again, it's a learning process. It takes some years. Don't yeah. get discouraged if, the first year you're gardening and second year gardening and some something comes in and just devastates your yeah. your crops. I had a Japanese beetle issue a few years ago that just I did it last was year. So bad. And, and I I they came out and ate all the leaves off well, almost yeah. all the leaves off my new apple trees. Yeah. And um and you'll I don't have years like that. You know, what but, I ended up doing, we ended up getting all of them off. I shook them, shook the trees and we ended up using a wedding tool that I got at a garage sale. I found like a bolt of it, which is, if you don't know what a bolt is, it's like when you go to the fabric store, it's that mm-hmm. cardboard thing it's on. I found a bolt of it at a garage sale for cheap. I cut that up and put it over top of all of, cause they were small enough, all the apple trees to keep them from killing them. Yeah, because they were decimating them. Oh yeah, they they I had some rose bushes and some blackberry and raspberry bushes. Now those are all pretty hardy things, so they came back fine the next year. But they just chewed every leaf off of those things, you know. And there's beans. Oh, they love beans. They was a, eating my beans down leaps down to nothing. Yeah. So, but then I ain't had a problem with them since, you know. So I mean, it's just things will come, things will go. You'll learn some things you can do. Some things, yeah. there's some things you can't do about anything. You get a big swarm of grasshoppers coming through or something it can devastate you you know but yeah even us, again next I mean, year I, yeah. <laughs> i've been gardening for a long time and and every year i don't always have an infestation but we still lose plants yeah it happens you and i still lose plants we still have failed crops it, it's just kind of goes and, with, goes with it and it's why you plant a lot of diversity in your gardens too because most insects yeah won't eat every plant. So if you got some other, some substitute plants, some, something else you can eat that's yep. like that, or, you know, you want a lot of diversity because like I said, some years 
some things will get pretty hard, hit pretty hard. Some years, the other plants might get pretty hard. It just, it kind of goes, it's ebb and flow. I mean, things just come and go and it's just the way it is. It's gardening, you know, and, and, and homesteading in general. And, uh, it just deal with it. Don't get overly discouraged and and move on. And, and yeah. it's just something you want to keep an eye out for because there are some things you can do for some things. Yes. And if you don't get hit with disease and you don't get hit with pests, sometimes there's weather. <laughs> we've had <laughs> well, we've had hailstorms here. Yeah. Um, we've had last year. You and I both had, even though we're quite a ways apart, we both had droughts. We had yeah. two six week droughts separated by rain in between. Um, we've had years, I think it was two or three years, maybe it was three years ago. I had issues with disease because it rained nonstop. Yeah. I mean, just rained and rained and rained. And then we just got a frost. So I mean, yeah, so the weather does play yeah, a lot. You're large keeping an eye out for wind. things like you're definitely yeah. going to be watching for late frost because you need to be paying attention to the weather because you might have to run out there and cover yeah. things up. Like you're in danger of that right now where you're at. Me, me too. I mean, it's not impossible that next week a frost right. could come in here. It's not impossible. So I could be out there covering stuff up. I hope that doesn't happen because I probably yeah. won't even remember. But you should be watching the weather and paying attention to those things. I've seen hailstorms wop, and there's not a lot you can do about it. those. Oh, come on, not. suddenly and they'll wipe out. I mean, wipe out some crops. Um, like you said, a, a heavy drought with strict uh, heavy sun. You might be shading things. You might be putting up shade cloth, watering a lot. Now, when you start watering overhead a lot, you're in by disease issues. And I think I right. mentioned before how I had I was doing a lot of overhead watering last year with the sprinkler system. So a lot of my corn, I ended up with smut corn, which is a delicacy for some people and not for this old boy, but for a lot of people, it's a, it's a delicacy. Yeah. And um, like a lot of my corn turned to smut last year, which if you don't know what that is, go look it up. It looks disgusting. It does look some disgusting. people swear it's delicious. And I'm like, mm, come to my no place thanks. and get all you want because <laughs> I had a bunch of it. But that will, you know, that can cause things like yeah. that. So, I mean, you just got to be on your toes and be watching for things. And, and even in the fall, I mean, it, there's things can come in early and, you know, and, 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 you know, and I start thinking about things like cover crops, you know, when I'm putting those, you know, watch for when they're full mature before they go to seed so you can get those chopped down. And, you know, I mean, there's just, there's always things you're watching, you know, it's not just plant, wait a few months and harvest. There's a whole season of maintenance. Yeah. In the meantime, that you have to pay attention to. I think that is why, you know, when we talk about permaculture, the zones are so important, mm -hmm. at least for me, because if your garden is way out in zone five, which would be so far from your house, you tend to not go to it as much. My, right. because we're on a small lot, everything's almost zone one, but I do have corners of the house, my I property that are do. probably my yeah. zone five that I just don't go to. There's one side of the house. We just don't go on this side. It's all shaded. There's nothing over there. Yeah. But my garden's probably my zone two-ish, one-ish, mm -hmm. two-ish. And I go out there every day. And you just... Uh I, I I actually lost my mushroom beds because of that. Because, of course, the the like you just mentioned, the shady side of your house. The shady side of my house, a few years ago, I put mushroom beds in. I filled them with wood chips and I planted mushrooms in them. And I was going to... But one of the things you have to do with mushrooms is... You can't let them dry out, right? They yeah. need moist. Yeah, they and, need and because I never went over there, they end up, you know, I got I, I got a few, but I just didn't stay on top of it and keep it wet like it needed to. And because I just, it's that zone area there. It's probably like right. a three or four for me because I never yeah. go over there, right? And uh, and then even on, on the side of my house, I do go to more often. It's still my main garden, which is actually further away from my house, is probably in a permaculture zone closer than the raised beds I have right beside my house because Same I have to come here. out this door yeah. and walk up beside my house. Never hardly do that. I walk right. through the gate out into the bigger garden. Exactly. So it's probably a zone further away, even though it's closer. Right. Mine is. Even though it's closer yeah. to me than that garden. Yeah. Yeah. So place your garden where you're going to visit often. Mine is actually on the way to the mailbox. So I'll go through the garden <laughs> yeah. and then go get the mail and then come yeah. back through the garden the, the different way. And yeah. Spend time watching it. It's important. It's not just for your own mental health, which is part of that too, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love, I love to watch my garden. I love it. It's my, grab a cup of coffee and take a stroll through my garden is probably one of my favorite things in the world. I just love, it. especially middle of the summer when everything's great and just full and it's like a jungle out there and you got these paths going through it. I, it's yeah. it's one of my life's greatest joys for me. It really is. Yeah, but it it's is it's more too. than just that. It's important that you do it for your garden. <laughs> and we we already have the neighbors stopping by. I don't even hardly really. Have. I think everybody saw, if you're in the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, everybody saw my, I feel like it looks naked. 
Yeah. And we've already had I always the, feel that way. This time yeah, of we've, year. we've already had the neighbors stop buying. What are you planting this year? Yeah. What is what's this right here? And yeah, and I, I love that part of it too, even as an introvert. I love that community. Yeah, the I do too. To see the, yeah. Introvert for me is me not going to other people. When people come to me, I really like it and have fun conversations with them. <laughs> but I don't go looking out for them. I don't go to look, find them to talk to. Right, right, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. gardening, I mean, all things are, you want to talk, you want to get me talking? Gardening. Yeah, I've seen this. I've seen that. Sure, introvert, yes. but willing to talk about plants. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's me too. I'll talk about gardening all day long with anybody. So, well, we mentioned some good books. Some of them we haven't mentioned yet, but we have some links in the show notes today of some helpful books. Uh, we talked about uh, weed suppression and we help with weeds. John Moody, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, wrote a great book called Winning the War on Weeds. I'll put a link for that. It's a great little book that just kind of gives you a lot of ideas to just control weeds on your property. And a lot of it's weed suppression. A lot of it's uh a lot of it is is kind of getting ahead of it before you put the garden in through things like solarization. He covers all, all diff- a lot of different methods for killing the weed seeds to to getting to controlling the plants after they're in the garden. It's a good one. A book I uh came across recently called The Perma The Practical Permaculture Project. What I like about that book is it's got all these great diagrams in it. And it's just really good on if you're thinking about like water management techniques, nutrient controlling like the food soil web kind of thing, keeping your right. soil healthy. It's a really good book and it's got really good diagrams in it, which is what I really, really liked about it. A uh, book we've mentioned a few times, The Living Soil Handbook by Jesse Frost. A That's really a great book. one. He's a market gardener. He knows a lot about keeping soil um, fed well. To he keep has a great your plants. YouTube channel too. Yeah, yeah. He's got a podcast as well. So he's he's got a lot going on there. Um, and then I ran across this um really great website. Well, it's growveg.com, but they have an actual uh part of their website is plant diseases, uh, and it's really good color pictures that show you, like you were talking about That's with cool. that book. That website has it and it's free. Website. You can just go there That's and great. I'll put a link for that in the show notes as well. And then your books that you mentioned. Well, I have um, the other Rodell book that I mentioned is the Rodell's Ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. That has a ton of information in it, probably more than the yeah, one. It's I like seven hundred and something pages. I think you 700 said seven hundred and some pages. It's yeah, huge, but it, it doesn't have color pictures, which is why I like the other one better. This this one is pretty exhaustive, but it's oh, there's yeah. no colored pictures. So, yeah. and then um, another one is Rodell, the complete book of composting. And I know that this wasn't about composting, but we talked about adding compost to our beds and how that can help with nutrition in the soil. And um, that one actually is an older one, but there's a new updated version on Amazon that is there. And then there's two books by the same author. One is called Let It Rot and the other one's a mulch book. And those are actually smaller in size, but they're pretty concise and talk about using different mulches to use and then Mm -hmm. again composting but i also added my hula ho which is what it's called i called it a hort uh what did i call it i can't remember what i I don't know but i stuck it in my shopping cart right after we talked about it oh yeah that (laughs) thing is amazing so we actually have a really old one and i need to get a newer one because this one's on its last leg but we even sharpen it yeah, it basically, really it, unlike a traditional hoe, which is just a flat plate that's sharp on the, the this is this is a, a, a I don't know what the shape. It's not square, but it's close to square. Right. And then, but it's hollow in the middle, and and it basically you it, just drag it, it across cuts. The top. You, uh, yeah. you kind of run it underneath or across the top of the soil, and it'll chop the weeds. This slices right. them right. basically, but and, it doesn't yeah. disturb the. It do, it just gets that very top layer and just cuts off those little weeds. And I love that one. And then the one that I use between plants, if I have space between plants, which I kind of don't, but I really like this one and it's super sharp is just a little hand hoe. Little little hand hoes are great early on when your seedlings are just starting to pop up and you're trying to keep the weeds out in the middle of the rows. Yeah. They're really handy. Yeah. It's really handy. It's super sharp. And um, I also will sharpen that one sometimes. And um, those are the things I use. I tend to not use a ton of tools in my garden. Well, once everything kind of gets mature, you don't really need yeah. to. I mean, it's just, I mean, honestly, a hoary hoary knife 
is probably my most used oh, yeah. tool in my garden. Probably. And I use it for planting. I use it for maintenance, like cutting out weeds and things like that. And I use it for harvesting. So, I mean, it's like my right. all season tool, really. Well, and you and I grow so intensively. Yeah. I mean, I can see if you have like an acre market garden or an acre garden or something like that, where you would use these tools maybe yeah. more. I guess but... I'll drop a link for the Hori Hori knife in there. Yeah, as well. I don't have like one really... of those. It's been on my Oh, really? You don't have one? Oh, I love no. my Hori Hori knife. It's like when I'm out in the garden, it's like usually used to, it was always like those little space. You know, you're always that's what I'm things. using right now. Is Man, when I got a Hori Hori knife, it was like the tool that replaced everything for me. Like I can, you can like it's got a little, almost like a saw blade on one side of it, so you can like cut things if you have to. Um, like have thicker. Uh, Does yours have a little thing and, that you can put like on your belt? The sheath, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. stuff like that because oh, you don't I love have to it. It's so, so nice. Stuff. Now the one I got, and I love the one I've got. The knife itself is great. The sheath is a really cheap sheath. It works, but it's not right. like I've seen some that come with like a really heavy leather, really nice sheath. Mine's kind of, I think it's like a like a vinyl material, like plastic or something. Right. It holds it though. It works good. It's. It I mean, works, I've had it yeah. for like three years and it's still holding up, but you can just tell it's not real heavy duty, but I like the knife and, and it's, it's a really affordable Hori Hori knife too. So right, I, yeah. I, it's the one I'll probably link to in the, in the show notes, That's cool. but yeah, plenty of, plenty of links plus the two books we recommended today, plus all these others we recommend. I don't know. We always recommend more than <laughs> our two recommendations, but yeah. um yeah, there's a lot of good things you can look at in the show notes. So go check those out, but I hope folks it gets you thinking Beyond just the seeding, the sowing, mm -hmm. the the harvesting, gardening is a process. And some people might listen to this and say, I was like, oh my gosh, it sounds like so much work. But for me, this is when the fun starts. <laughs> I mean, to me, the it seeding is. and the harvesting is actually the hard work that I don't enjoy as much. I love the in the middle. I love oh, yeah. this. You know. People think this part's a lot of work. For me, the hard work has been, actually for me, the hard work is right now. For me, the hard work has been when yeah. I started my seeds and they've been yeah. under grow lights. Now it feels like forever. And they take so much more of my time right now. Once they're in the ground, they don't really take yeah. that much of my time. And right. if you wait till things get out of control, they will. But if you just yeah. take your 15 or 20 minute stroll through the garden every day, that's really. Yeah about all it takes and then you start to reap that the harvest and that's really fun when you get to absolutely eat. yeah and then it becomes a whole nother then it becomes work again because now you're trying to preserve everything so <laughs> yeah if you preserve it some people have yeah. small enough gardens that don't or you just you pass it right. all out to everybody but there um, you go yeah but yeah. yeah but just don't forget to love it just don't forget to enjoy it you know because yeah. i mean we get so wrapped up in the hard work of it sometimes that enjoy it just really get out there and just yeah. And, and, and enjoy your time in the garden doing doing the weeding the watching you know the the watering enjoy the process because that's really what it's about and and i'm going to tell you what the health benefits and plant uh, nutrient dense food the um the uh the exercise you get in the garden those are all great things do not air. underestimate yeah. the value of the mental part of it oh, the getting yeah. out there and enjoying it. It's so valuable and it will do a lot for your health. It really will. Yeah. So yeah. don't forget about that part. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Rachel, before we let them no, go? No, I think that's it. All right, folks. Until next week, happy homesteading. God bless. And grow where you're planted. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race, I wanna flee. My world, I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. It's a modern. Build a modern homestead A lot of folks don't understand Why I wanna live this way They've never eaten from their land Like we do here every day Snapping beans like Grandma did Sitting on her front porch Hunting and fishing like a kid Once you've done all of your chores It's a modern homestead Build a modern homestead Country or city, there's a way to make this change
change, you gotta start today.